Okay, great. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm glad to see everybody that showed up. Um, those that didn't show up will get the recording, so it's all good at the end. Everything happens as it must. And um, tonight I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of the problems and solutions of South African education. I've been working with um, the international team and the Africa team for just over two years now. Um, and the international team is headed up by the GEAC, which stands for the Global Education Advisory Consortium, and it's headed up by Monica Nagy. And so for two years now, we've been working on problems, problems and solutions for South Africa and for Africa in general, because there are many of the problems and the solutions that are very similar. So I have got um, a PowerPoint slide. Yeah, problems and solutions. And I'm just opening this, I'm just making it full screen. Tandy, how's the, the view from there? Good. Okay, great. All right. Okay, so um, education is very important. If we can change the next generation of children to critical thinking, problem-solving individuals with high self-esteem, um, they are going to change the world. But education at the moment is in our hands and we have to bring in the initial changes. So we're looking at the amazing future of South Africans' children and the education problems and solutions. And I, Right, so what are we dreaming of for the future of our education? We're dreaming of new types of learning institutions with child-centered education. This word child-centered, you're going to hear a lot in the future. We need self-sustainable schools and communities. That means that every school must become self-sustainable. Um, so they've got to run themselves like a business and bring in money and generate money and turn it into a business so that they're not reliant on funding from outside. And then every school must have nutritious, clean water and sanitation. And um, that's for the schools and all of the communities. That's a pressing issue in South Africa. So we're going to look at the teaching. So we need logical and creative individuals. So a different style of learning is needed. So there are a lot of new techniques that we've been exploring. We are going to be switching to no exam focused teaching. Um, it's already been done in many places in the world where they're not writing exams. It's more of a problem for the parents than for the children until they, the parents understand where we are going with this because they're still thinking a lot in the old paradigm. So there will be no grades, a lot of self-assessment, small group learning and peer teaching. So children helping each other, that prepares them for life because life is after all about helping one another. So reimagining boring, inappropriate and outdated classes. And to do that, we're going to be bringing in those new learning styles. And we're going to be starting the little ones um, on the Montessori method. It's a learning by active participation. And there are a lot of good reasons why it's a good place to start with the youngsters. As they get a little bit older, they can diversify to different types of um, schools and so on and you, you know move along um, to where their interests are as they grow older. Every child will have a personalized learning plan. In the past everybody's had to do exactly the same thing all together in a class. So smaller classes of 20 students per teacher plus a teacher's assistant. So every a teacher will have an assistant and no more than 20 children per class. So that's also gonna open up the um, workplace for many, many more teachers to come on board. Students choose their learning assignments. So they choose that according to what they're interested in. And when they're interested in a subject, they learn much better. There will be no formal classes, only self-motivated explorative groups. 
So children need to gain more advanced technical skills at school. They need higher technical knowledge. They need to know more about IT, robotics, computer science, engineering, computer assisted engineering drawings. And that is of course for the kids that are technically minded and for who this is an interest of theirs, not for everybody. We're gonna be crea creating more practical subjects in the schools and um, practical learning opportunities with many technical subjects and agriculture as well. And some of the technical skills and skills will be plumber, electrician, arable farming, animal husbandry, agricultural science, building contractor, metalwork, woodwork, domestic sciences, and sewing. So agriculture on school level in the past was made up of these three, arable farming, animal husbandry, and agricultural sciences, which is a more scientific side of, of um, agriculture. So the Kins Learning System is just one of the other systems, but um, Tandy and I have identified it as one of the systems that we'll be bringing on board probably in quite a big way in South Africa. In the following presentation, I'll take you through the seven different learning systems that we'll be using, mixing and matching, as well as the blended learning, flipped learning, and things like that. But just be aware, Kins is only one of them, but a good one for South Africa. Why? Because it's ideal for children who do not function well in an academic environment, and there are plenty of them. And ideal for those with concentration problems. Children participate in all the work in and around the school. This includes agriculture and the building of the school. So with the Kins system, the children actually design and build the school themselves. Yes, with help. And they learn all of this by being immersed in practical activities with mixed age groups. So the younger ones learn from the older ones. Um, and the system works very well. There's a beautiful school in, in Russia that runs on this system. And the children that are, are leaving that school are um, just magnificently prepared for life. We need to motivate school attendance. We've got a very high level of dropout in our South African schools. So we need to create opportunities for exploration. Note the word exploration versus learning or schooling. We need to appoint advisors and counselors to assist learners identify their passions and aptitudes. So from a young age, children will have their passions and aptitudes looked at, they'll be allowed to diversify into the areas that are important for them. And a simple example, if someone's born to be a dancer and an actor, maths and science and geography is not going to help them. It's just going to, to make them want to leave school or to drop out of school. There will be the introduction of new certification for topics and fields of interest is a group of people that's working on all of that. And learning has to be linked to real life problem solving. And so every community has got different problems and different things that are going on in their communities. So every school will be different and it'll be linked to the real life problems in that particular community. Keep school fun and interesting link holistic learning and brain integration to all areas of learner participation. So holistic learning means that you're bringing in the heart, the mind, the, you know, the emotions, everything, every part is um, being used in the learning experience, not just the brain or just the visual, but every part. Motivate students to choose their own subjects and projects that will stimulate their minds and boost their enthusiasm to participate. So I think we all know that when children are enthusiastic, they've got high energy and um, the sky's the limit. So that is what we want. Schooling hours need to be all age appropriate. The amount of hours that children are going to school at the moment is far too many. And many of those hours are taken up with um, with um, things that they that they are doing that's got nothing to do with um, with their futures at all. So primary school, two to three hours of uninterrupted work is enough 
for the primary schools and high schools three to five hours is sufficient. The rest of the day, they need to be doing all kinds of other tasks, you know, maybe working outside in the gardens, playing sport or doing extracurricular activities of a spiritual nature, perhaps. So languages in South Africa, you know that we have 11 official languages, excluding Khoi and San and Sign language. Um, a lot of the more advanced schools across the globe are using sign language as a way to calm the children down in the mornings. They start off with sign language because it's an activity where the children are engaged and where they are crossing the midline, which means the right hand is crossing over the middle of the body to the left and the left hand crossing over the middle of the body to the right. And this crossing of the midline helps them to integrate their brain. And um, of course, being busy and, you know, um, with, with, a, with a task that is physical helps them to just settle for the day. So it's a great introductory activity. So let's help children to keep their home language and learn a second and a third one. Home language is very important. That's how you communicate with your grandparents, your parents. Um, so yeah, we want to keep that. Organize the curriculum to accommodate all spoken languages. And there is a team that is busy at that mo this moment already with the curriculums, which are going to be extremely flexible um, and adaptable and yet have specific things that need to be achieved at specific levels. So language exchange programs encourage learners to learn different languages by facilitating teacher and student exchange problem, uh, programs. We've already been speaking on the Africa group. They are so keen to do exchange programs and have our South African teachers go over and visit them and the other way around and the same with the students. Um, so it'll be a great opportunity for all, not just in Africa, but globally as well. Incorporate language studies as part of daily activities. That means that language can be learned while you're doing any other activity. You don't need to have a specific language period where you just sit down and study language. It can be learned in many different ways while you're busy with other things. Add other languages by the latest, the third grade. So the sooner children are introduced to more than just their home language, um, the easier and the quicker they learn it. And from my experience as well, the earlier they start speaking a second or a third language, the better their um, accent is. Uh, you don't end up being like me. You only learned Afrikaans from about standard four, really started speaking it when I went to an Afrikaans school. And my Afrikaans has got a beautiful English accent to it, no matter how well my written Afrikaans is. And that is because I didn't learn to speak it fluently before um, the age of about six to eight years old is ideal. So we need to highlight local languages while exposing kids to international languages as well. And there are some wonderful opportunities for children that speak multiple languages in all kinds of directions. So teacher motivation, we need to have a look at how we're going to motivate teachers to come on board in future. Firstly, they need to have housing. We're going to be providing housing for the teachers. And if the schools are out in the country, then the housing will be on the same, on the same property as what the school is. So housing will already be something that's going to draw them. And we need to employ passionate, self-motivated teachers and support staff. So no more are we going to just say when children leave school, who wants to become a teacher? And when they can't find anything else to do, they decide to become teachers. Teachers will be very well screened on all levels, including um, how they function emotionally, how motivated they are, how they deal with children, how they deal with problems. So it's going to become a highly sought after career where not everybody will be allowed access to it. 
they're going to be getting decent salaries and why we need to up their salaries. And um, Monica reckons we need to put them on the same salaries as engineers is so that we can actually bring in the retired engineers and retired farmers, people that have actually got background in applying everything practically and know the real life application of stuff, haven't just learned stuff from textbooks. So if the salaries are, are comp competitive, then you may have an engineer that's really passionate about um, education and teaching, but he didn't become a teacher because of the salary and that will change everything. It'll bring a lot of people on board and also a lot of retired teachers and retired people because Monica is very adamant that 60 or 65, which was the old retirement age, that is going to fall away completely. Um, teachers that are a little bit older have got a lifetime of experience and they are more than welcome. Also going to be providing a wider range of educator levels that can be attained by creating new speciality diplomas. That means that they will start as a teacher's assistant, that will be level one on a certain pay grade, and they will move up from there until you've got the very highly qualified teachers with a master's degree that are also qualified in special needs, also have their psychology degrees and so on. So there's going to be many, many levels and a huge scope for those that want to progress up the ranks and make more of themselves and be of more use. So we need to also provide access to online education with private universities and institutions so that people can obtain international recognition. And that's another thing that we're going to be focused on very highly is that um, in future, people will be able to move around internationally and everybody will know what everybody's capable of doing in the new system. It won't be that if you were educated in a certain country that you're not welcome because of the country's education level or anything like that. It's going to be very much internationally aligned so, and interchangeable. So that also means if people emigrate, they'll be able to seamlessly go from one place to another. And we're gonna be creating mentors and facilitators instead of traditional teachers. So we no longer want people that stand up in front of the class and write things on the board and teach. We want mentors and facilitators. That means that all existing teachers are going to have to go through um, um, updated training, in how to be facilitators and to, to assist and prompt and provide direction rather than to teach. Principals priorities is also going to be very important because they need to find passionate educators that can fill the positions for permanent and part-time staff. And these staff are going to be a wide variety of staff, much more than what there is at the moment at the schools. We're going to be starting off with the teacher's assistants and then the teachers. They're going to be qualified doctors and nurses affiliated to each school. Not only will they be there to help with, um, with the health and wellness of the children, but they will also be pulled into the classes if some children are doing projects on um, some, some may want to become doctors and they may be doing projects on the organs in the body or something. And then they'll be around and they'll be able to call, be called into the classes, the same with the nurses. So a lot of these people will be circulating amongst the classes um, as and when it is necessary. Also engineers that will circulate amongst the classes. Craftsmen, tradesmen, and other miscellaneous staff, which will depend on the nature of the school and the kinds of things that the children are doing and learning. And all staff needs to be provided with advancement and get the latest excellence training. Education is ongoing, it should never come to a halt. They need to prioritize excellent people skills and networking skills. 
the relationship between um, the children and the teachers or the mentors and the other people on the campus are going to be very, very important because that's going to be one of the focus areas of all the schools in the future. And they need to stay abreast with the latest in education from the Global Education Advisory Consortium, who are just an advisory body there if anybody needs help, they don't dictate or control. So we're going to improve student to teacher ratio. And the beauty with the Montessori system is that teachers assistants can be trained within three months. So in three months, once um, everything opens up in the future, we will be able to provide every teacher with an assistant. And that's gonna be amazing. And those assistants will already start earning a salary. And those teachers assistants can be mothers, they can be grandmothers, they can be anybody from the community, or they can be potential teachers that are starting and gonna work their way up through the ranks. All teachers in training must complete time as a teacher's assistant as a prerequisite to teaching in the GEAC accredited exploratoriums. Exploratoriums is the new word for schools. We still talk about schools until everybody understands the new lingo, but they will be called GEAC exploratoriums. So teachers are not going to go to university or college and go through their three years training and see the inside of a classroom for the first time after that. They're going to have to start off doing um, being a teacher's assistant, even while they are studying. That will be part of the prerequisite. That will also help them to see if this is really what they want to do before they go right through and complete their studies. So by making use of people in the community, extra expertise can be brought in to assist teachers in the classroom and facilitate field trips. So here you can see there's a field trip and they're going to visit somebody. Maybe she's a receptionist at a hotel or something. And in that way, by making use of the community, the children have got a much wider um, scope of things that they are able to, to see and experience. So the healthcare professionals, we need to remove political and governmental control from the medical field. That is a whole area on its own, but that is the aim. We need to update medical training to include guidelines from the GHWC in healthcare. <laughs> now the GHWC stands for the Global Health and Wellness Consortium. We need to allow doctors to integrate naturopathic and allopathic medical care. So that has to change as well. At the moment, I think they're still heavily regulated with what they may and may not do. We need to source professionals with a passion for teaching to serve school children and staff. And that includes the doctors, the nurses. They all need to have a passion for teaching because they can all be pulled into the classrooms um, or the, the groups, the, uh, the project groups at any point in time. Higher salaries to attract the best in the field and better working conditions. When it comes to dealing with the government, we're going to be creating these international GEAC accredited schools and private schools must become the new norm in South Africa until the old education system becomes redundant. So all we're doing is we're starting on our own, we're leaving the rest of the system as it is to carry on as it is and slowly, slowly it will become redundant as the children and the parents start to realize the benefits of these new schools. In South Africa, we have a lot of dangerous communities and here in Cape Town, we have a particular dangerous community, but it's all over. So having boarding schools available for children that are living in vulnerable communities or are orphaned or where home care lacks is something that's very important. Now, 
we don't want to pull children out of their home environment. It's very important that children are with their, with their parents in a home environment. But some children don't have that. And in those cases, boarding schools can provide that, let's say, home away from home or new home um, where they can get that kind of family feeling and experience what it's like to be in a in a more normal environment with siblings and so on. So we also need sufficient well-trained security staff that are able to protect the school property and all persons on campus 24 seven, especially in the beginning when we start um, opening up these new schools, we're gonna need a lot of security staff and protect schools from arson, from drug dealers, child traffickers, pimps, gangs, school shootings, and removing weapons from children and others that may interfere. So they need to be highly trained, highly skilled people that know what they are doing and what to look out for. And then private security escorts for school trips to ensure safety. So you can see that already in this new way of thinking about the future of schools, there's already a multitude of opportunities for, for job creation. So family and community are the nucleus of education. And we're going to be creating community gathering spaces within the schools where parents can socialize and form support groups. So we want the parents to become part of the school, to participate in the school, even to come in and share their expertise or to arrange field trips for the, for the kids to go and visit their workplaces or their businesses, a full integration of parents. At the moment, I can tell you that there are many parents that have no idea what their children are doing at school. And um, I know that for a fact from my own grandchildren because uh, parents are just so busy sometimes and they, they just leave everything in the hands of the school. But now they're going to have the opportunity to integrate with the schools a lot more. Then aftercare facilities for children who have parents that work longer hours. And these aftercare facilities are very necessary to keep children occupied. If they've got any extra work they need to do in the afternoon that there are people there that can help them as well. And boarding facilities for children who live far. So boarding facilities are not only for those who have got the situations at home that are not conducive for, for staying there, but also for those who live far, you may have children living in remote areas on farms that will come in from Monday to Friday, for example, and then go back weekends and school buses and shuttle services will be made available. These boarding facilities will also um, serve another purpose and that is for example if a parent is ill and can't take care of the children for a while or if they need to go abroad for work or something then the children can be put into those boarding facilities for that for that time and the parents don't need to worry about them or you know meals or um, taking and fetching them from school and there will be extra tutoring for those who are far behind. Online classes for children who cannot attend school due to illness or other reasons. And when we look at the other models in a, in a following presentation, you will see how, how wonderfully this is going to work where children can either do online classes or come to school. And on any given day for any reason that can be interchangeable. And um, there will also be satellite campuses and things set up for these kinds of um, facilitation methods. And then education is not just about children, it's also about adults. And the schools can be used after hours for adult education, um, learning parenting skills. You know, one thing that we don't get when we get our children is we don't get a manual that comes with them. 
And I remember just, I couldn't wait to, to have my own family. And once these kids started arriving, I had no clue what to do with them. And so they cried and I cried for a lot of time in the beginning. And there was nowhere where you could go to learn parenting skills and to learn about health and nutrition and things in those days, other than going to, to the clinic. Um, but yeah. We're not prepared to raise these children. We need to overcome cultural challenges. And in South Africa, there are many. All religions and cultural festivals must be respected. Remember that religions and cultural activities and festivals are part of the nucleus of a community and a family. And that needs to be respected. Schools need to recognize alternative and cultural healers should their services be required for specific families. So no more just the, the, the school doctor or the school nurse that comes around. There needs to be other kinds of people that are welcome as well. Teenagers and parents must be educated on the dangers of mutilation, ritual practices during the coming of age ceremonies. And in South Africa, we lose a lot of children every year to these ritual practices um, I'm sure you've all heard horrible stories about that. Children must know that they are sovereign beings and do not have to be subverted to early arranged and forced marriage or non-consensual sexual practices. This is probably going to take a while to turn around, um, but the more sovereign everybody becomes, the easier it's going to be for them to say no and to change the way things have been done in the past. And every child has the right to education. I almost want to add to that, every adult also has the right to education. Everybody has the right to education. So when it comes to child labor, teen pregnancies and early marriage, we need to eliminate child labor by getting all children into schools. Now, this is not so prevalent a problem, although it is a problem in South Africa, but not as prevalent in some of the African countries. And in conversations with them over these last two years, um, there's a trend where parents often don't allow the children to go to school because they don't think there's any value in the children going to school. They need to stay home and work the lands and look after the cattle. And then suddenly these children arrive at school when they are 16 years old and the parent now wants them to quickly go through matric. So they have a huge problem with that in Africa. And I'm sure in some areas of South Africa, we will have the same issues. We need to educate parents to understand the advantages of education. And as far as I'm concerned, this is going to be our biggest challenge, biggest, biggest challenge of everything is to educate the parents. Um, they're still very caught up in the old ways, and I have conversations with friends regularly. I had one um, early this week and on Monday. I popped in at a friend in Robertson, and we had a conversation. And she was telling me how wonderful schooling was in the old days, where everybody was disciplined, and everybody did the same, and everybody had to learn, and everybody wrote exams. And I just said, yeah. Yeah, okay, okay. I don't get into conversations with my friends with those things because they my friends at the end of the day. But they do remind me of what a task we have to have ahead of us to educate parents and grandparents to understand the advantages of the new ways of doing things. To integrate school projects with local businesses so that children volunteer and gain practical experience. So this is one of the laws that we're going to have to change at the moment, for example, children in agricultural schools um, are not allowed to do manual labor. Now, I went to an Afrikaans agricultural high school in Michalisburg, and there in the afternoons, we worked the lands. In the morning, the cattle had to, the cows had to be milked, um, cattle had to be dipped. All of that was done by by the children it was part of their practical experience but then they brought in this whole all of these laws about child labor and now my heart my heart cries when I look at the school that I went to with children standing in uniforms watching laborers working the lands and 
um, getting to visit the milking stables to see them put on the, um, the milking machines and milk the cows. They don't get any of that practical experience anymore because their lines have been become blurred between what is practical experience and what is child labor. So if we integrate the schools with local businesses, then children can volunteer to go and do part of their education in those businesses, and it will be seen as practical experience and they'll gain credits for that. So let the pregnant girls continue to attend class without feeling shamed or excluded. And these classes will depend on the communities as well. Some may um, continue in the schools that they were in. Some of them may prefer to move to a different school where they are learning skills more to do with parenting and you know, housekeeping and cooking and whatever the case may be. Um, so each community will decide on that. And then once baby is born, it can attend the campus daycare center and mother can continue with her education. So the schools will have daycare centers for the children of the teachers, the doctors, the nurses and everybody else that's working at the school. And so it'll be great if these children can continue with their schooling and the babies are taken care of and the children during the day. And then instead of having a drop out pregnant mom with no way to uh, look after herself and her child and to be dependent on government systems, um, she will be able to continue with her education and make something of her life. There will also be classes for young moms to be, which will be more specifically aimed for them. And by bringing in the boarding facilities, it will keep girls safer, especially those in vulnerable communities. And that could drop the pregnancy rate as well, hopefully. So help for the poor. Um, this is a big problem in South Africa. You know, a lot of people aren't even affording the government schools at the moment in South Africa. So education will be free for all children and breakfast and lunch will be provided at school. Clothing banks can be set up at schools. So if children can't afford to buy clothes, uniforms, whatever it is, um, I suppose each school will decide for themselves whether they want a uniform or whether they're not gonna use uniforms. Nothing is going to be prescribed in the future. It will all be decided on by the communities. But clothing banks will work very well there. And then Life Force Essentials. Life Force has been rebranded as CARE, which is Center for Amity and Restoration of Earth. So Life Force is now CARE, and the Essentials card will be there for clothing, toiletries, and supplements. So basic needs will be covered with the Essentials card. And medical staff will be available at the schools and the assurance card will cover specialist doctor's visits. So in this way, in the future, um, all, all poor people will be taken care of. Everybody will be taken care of. But it's going to be a tremendous um, relief for those that aren't managing financially at the moment. We need to create childhood um, education from an earlier age. So early childhood learning centers, um, there's a great need for those. Let learning be fun and exploratory by teaching gross motor, social, emotional, and perceptual skills from a young age, children will be school ready. So what people don't realize is that you don't learn to read and write the day you go to grade one. So if you didn't go to any preschool um, facility or didn't do any activities with your parents when you, were, when you were young and you go to grade one, you already have a backlog because these perceptual skills need to be taught from birth. And I will give you a simple example um, so that you can understand where I'm coming from. So let's take the simple example that we, we all know that when you go to school, you need to be able to read, you need to be able to copy from the board, and you need to be able to write. Now, to be able to read 
One of the perceptual skills is visual discrimination. That means that you need to be able to discriminate between various shapes. So if you can't discriminate between a circle and a square, you can't discriminate between an A or an O or any of the alphabet letters for that matter. So the start of reading starts with learning to, to visually discriminate between various shapes, colors, sizes, and they need to learn to recognize shapes it's called form constancy. You need to recognize that a circle is a circle regardless of its color, its position, its angle. And so if you think of copying from a board and you're copying, let's say the letter A from the board, you're looking at the board, which is an, in a vertical position and there's a big A on the board, probably written in white chalk. Now you have to copy that into your book, which is now horizontal, and you have to copy it maybe in a blue pen or something in a much smaller way than what it is on the board. And so that is form constancy. So angle, position, size, they need to recognize that it's exactly the same thing. And then another very simple skill is called visual memory, which means you need to be able to remember for a while what you have seen. So if you don't develop visual memory um, in childhood, you can't look at the board, see what's written on the board, remember it long enough to write it down. And these are just a couple of examples that I've given you. The same with writing, they need to be able to cross the midline, otherwise they're going to be putting their book to the right hand side or the left hand side of them and writing and working all on one side because the great brain integration hasn't happened. And if teachers know what they're doing and they've got children at early childhood learning centers, they'll watch little things, for example, when the children are eating, um, put the plate right in the middle in front of them and they eat with their dominant hand. And do they cross over their midline to eat from the left-hand side of the plate, for example, or do they turn their plate? So if you see children turning their plates and putting their work all on one side, you know for a fact they're not able to, to cross the midline. And these are all things that need to be done at a much younger age in, an, in a playful environment so that when they get to school, they can apply these, these skills. And then to use unique teaching techniques to teach children to get in touch with their outer consciousness. And um, these are things like telepathy, outer viewing, third eye development, and other gifts. So the children that are coming to earth at the moment are very far advanced with a lot of these techniques. And we need to accommodate them so that they can use and develop these skills. So school campuses are going to look very different. They're going to, we're going to incorporate unique architecture with fluid lines, good flow, big windows to allow for natural light and good ventilation, use locally sourced, environmentally friendly building materials. Um, locally sourced, of course, because every penny that goes into a school should be boosting the local businesses in that area first as far as possible. And then to use off-grid energy solutions, explore radio internet service providers as a safe alternative to current technology, create beautiful green belt areas around the school to bring nature to the building. And um, yeah, you'll hear architects talking about seamlessly merging the outdoors and the indoors. It's a, it's a lovely concept. So all building and construction materials should be non-toxic and properties should be sourced that have natural water sources to remain independent and off the grid. So yeah, properties must be carefully sourced for where these schools are going to be placed. Then there's a lovely concept that we call school in a bus. So we will also have a fleet of buses available for various scenarios. And here's just an example of a bus that's been kitted out. 
And these buses can be available for temporary classrooms while schools are being built or refurbished. So initially, um, there will be a lot of new schools built. Eventually, perhaps the existing schools will be completely demolished and broken down and new schools built. So you can see that there's going to definitely be a need for temporary classrooms. There can also be things that go wrong at the school, um, whatever that may be. There could be a fire or something like that. And then these buses can just be driven over and the temporary classrooms are already there. They can be used for catering facilities. They can be used as mobile libraries, as healthcare buses. And they can be used for adult education and teacher training because they can be driven to various communities at night and parked and used after school hours for, for different needs. Schools need to be self-sustainable. So as far as possible, let us all have food gardens, greenhouses, aquaponics, agriculture, They'll also depend on where the school is situated about, you know, which of these activities they can have. Schools need to have market days. Not only is it good training for young entrepreneurs, but it will also bring in finances for the school. Culinary schools can cater. So they can open up their own restaurants and cater for parents and the public. And in that way, they can generate an income for the school. There can be a renting out of gathering spaces. And I'm just thinking of things like weddings and things like that. These schools are going to be so beautiful that who knows, they may become the next sort of after wedding venues. Who knows? Remember, we're dreaming. So technical and mechanical projects can be income generating. For example, I know when my kids were um, in Kimberley or at school, there was a school there that taught mechanics and um, respraying of cars and so on. And you could actually take your car there and for a much cheaper rate, they would service your car or, you know, do panel beating or something like that. And yeah, that brings in money for the schools as well. And then crafting of furniture, um, the kids schools where they do everything themselves, they will be making their own furniture, they will doing their own metalwork, they'll be building their own schools anyway. Um, but from all that they learn from doing that, they'll be able to do it for other people as well and to generate an income. And classrooms and sports facilities and boarding school can be rented out during holidays. So there may be seminars for parents or um, people in the holistic industries or something, and they'll be able to rent these facilities, which will also bring in money for the schools. Nutrition and clean water, very important. It's the foundation of child survival and health and development. And well-nourished children are better able to grow and learn and fully participate in life. So we want to put an end to malnutrition. So these are just a couple of statistics. One in four children are stunted or too short for their age. So they, their growth has been stunted. One in eight are overweight. Um, and that's generally, um, well, a lot of it can be linked to poverty because the cheaper foods are the ones that, that are inclined to raise blood sugar and cause all kinds of damage. So the physical and cognitive damage caused by long-term malnutrition is irreversible. This actually hit me quite hard when, when I read this, um, that that damage is irreversible, so we need to prevent it at all costs. And only 32% of infants are exclusively breastfed. So the education on the benefits of breastfeeding will motivate families to prioritize breastfeeding, which will give children a better start in life. So we need to give these kids a really highly nutritious, good start in life. So yes, overweight is caused by food, low in nutrients and high in energy. And this is pre-COVID, yes, this one, 30% of South Africa's children live below the food poverty line. I think it's probably a lot more than that now. And so having children properly fed at school, and I'm not talking about some of the rubbish that children are getting at schools at the moment. Um, I'm talking about proper nutritious 
vegetables and fruit and stuff like that. And then cooperation between African countries, we've already forged those bonds. So teachers and students exchange programs will be happening. Conferences on educational updates will be held annually at various locations in Africa. And there's going to be cooperation and friendship between countries. And already, already Monica has got micro schools across the globe interacting with each other, um, showing each other their traditional dances and singing and what their schools look like. And the children ask each other questions. So cooperation between everybody and this will be global. And just to end off, these solutions were provided by the following countries, Burundi, Cameroon, Malawi, Mozambique, South Africa, and the United States. And lately, we're getting a lot of help from Kenya and Uganda as well. They're really doing magnificent things in Africa. <clears throat> I want to um, just thank Janet. That was a, this was beautiful, the whole presentation, and it really excites me. And my question would always always be, um, where does the psychotherapy and the trauma counselling come in into schools? Okay, just off the top of my head, I would say it would come in in two places. Firstly, um, schools would be able to employ people like that, you know, as they will employ a school doctor and school nurses, they would be able to employ people like that. And secondly, teachers will be able to work their way up so that they go beyond the normal, normal teaching degrees and incorporate those, incorporate, incorporate those kind of degrees further in their courses. Um, and the aim is to eventually have teachers that are similar to the teachers in Finland. Now, in Finland, every single teacher has got a master's degree. It's easier to become a doctor or a lawyer in Finland than to become a teacher. And um, yes, and so existing um, psychotherapy people and so on and psychologists will also be able to go and you know, do the teacher training courses as well to be able to take it into, into the classes. And of course, some of the projects that the children are doing may be geared towards those kind of subjects. It may be their interest. And um, then most definitely um, you could have a, somebody like that circulating in the schools. So yeah, does that answer your question, Elsie? Is there something else you wanna ask? Oh, that's uh, good to know what's happening in Finland. Thank you, Janet. Um, I just want to add to that. Um, there's other ways that children will be receiving therapy. And one of them is, for instance, with um, like the kids school where the kids will get all the practical experience. Um, we were talking about bringing the horses and donkeys into the schools where they need to be taken care of um, and maybe some farm animals because children need to learn to work with animals, treat them with respect, understand them, know how to care for them. And once it's often easier to learn to care and love an animal before it's, especially if you've had a tough early childhood. And from there, you can learn to love animals again. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. And I want to add to that because, um, Janet, you mentioned watching the children so that they cross the midline. By doing that, um, uh, children are actually accessing bigger parts of the, or, or more parts of their brain. And that's exactly what psychotherapy does. Yes. Creating new, new Yes. Anybody else got any questions? Okay, over to you, Tandy. Okay. Um, okay. In that case, um, nobody's got any questions. We will put the recording up. And I just 
want to thank everybody that has come tonight. Thank you very much for being here. And thank you so much, Janet, for presenting. Um, I would want to ask you, what is your next um, um, subject you're going to present is about the different schools? And that's going to be in January. Well, it will be whenever you want me to do it. It's ready to roll. But yes, there I've got two other presentations, much shorter than this one tonight. Tonight was a long overview one. I've got one on the seven different models of schools. I will mention them quickly for those that are interested. There's the Montessori, the Waldorf, the Kin School, the Arthur Morgan School, the... Um, I'm missing one there. Um, and then there's the big picture and there's the Agora model. And there's one that I skipped. But anyway, there are seven of them. They're all child focused, all very different in their own ways, but very, very exciting concepts. Um, and these schools have all been tried and tested over a couple of years. And um, the children that are leaving those schools are integrating extremely well into society. And then the other section that I'd like to present is to do with, with blended, blended schooling and flipped learning and um, integrated learning, different ways that we can use all of those in conjunction with um, some of those other schooling models, which we can also mix and match um, as we like. So every community will decide what it is they need and they'll make their own particular mix of, of schools. So yeah, that would be, I think, the next section, Tanya. Great. Thank you very much, Janet. Looking forward to that. I'll set up a time with you.